Good morning and welcome to our church at study. In this quarter, we'll explore the painful subject of death, but through the lens of hope offered through us through Jesus Christ. Our hope of eternal life is based on God's trustworthy promise of a perfect world with no more tears, pain, or death as seen in Revelation 21. This promise gives meaning and purpose to our present lives. It allows us to look into confidence into the future. It assures us that all our beloved ones who died in Christ will finally be raised from the dead to inherit eternal life. Our teachers have studied and prepared for this week's lesson. Now we'll turn it over to our teachers. Good morning, Sabbath School. Once again, we're so glad that you have taken the time to join us as we continue the study of death, dying, and our future hope. This morning, we are going to address a topic that has been very confusing and distorted in the world. But from the Word of God, we want to look at the fires of hell. Shall we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit with us? Father, we're so glad that you have allowed us yet another opportunity to dispel error in many of the concepts associated with death and dying, the resurrection, and today we will discuss hellfire. May you grant us the visitation of your Holy Spirit, and for those who are watching now and those who will watch later, clarity, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. We want to start with 1 Thessalonians 5 and 21 that says, test all things, hold fast what is good. Test all things, hold fast what is good. The, the Bible speaks. The Bible says death is asleep followed by the resurrection. That's says the Bible. The apostles taught that, but and in the early Roman church, leaders such as Clement, Ignatius, they taught that death is a sleep. Mm. But over a period of time, that came to be changed. And the notion of the immortal soul uh, where people would be tortured by fire in hell for eternity. The Bible speaks differently. The notion of the immortal soul teaching came in AD uh, 2040 when Tertullian, who was in the Roman province, which is now Tunisia, took up the teaching that the soul was immortal. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible in Genesis says that a God breathed into the man, and what happened? He became a living soul. He became a, he became living, a living soul. soul. There's nowhere in the Bible where the soul is different from the body is there. The Bible speaks. Later on, um, Augustine of Hippo, he started teaching about um, endless torment. That if you were to go to hell, when you die, you are going to fall into a fire, and the fire is endless. Brother Rodriguez is going to um, tell us about the meaning of everlasting. <laughs> it's not an everlasting forever. God, we know that, the, what do we know the Bible said that uh, God that takes no pleasure, no pleasure in, in, in people's suffering. Then we have something called purification where the body now of a person who does not go to hell and burn forever. But if there's something redeeming about them, hmm. 
they can now go into a place where they can be purified. And, and, and let's say that they themselves can't go to that place. They're going to have a family member mm. who, who, will, who will pay for them and offer some other thing. And they can be purified and eventually get to heaven. That is not what the Bible says. That is not what the Bible says. Yeah, maybe not at all. We now have Brother Rodriguez, Isaiah 66 and Mark 9. Mm. Is that evidence of everlasting burning hell? No, it is not. No, it is not. So we want to uh, first address this, uh, this topic, this idea of an immortal soul. And we all know that um, there are many concepts that are out in the world in terms of hellfire, and many of them are built on the premise that the, our souls are immortal. Okay, but what we want to first look at is this uh, text of scripture that teaches that Jesus uh, used and quoting Isaiah, Isaiah 66 and verse 24. Uh, it says, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpse of the men who have transgressed against me for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be in abhorrence to all flesh. Wow, that's a very graphic description of those who are dying. And this word that Jesus used in the scripture, the worm, is referring to worms that are eating decomposing bodies. Now, in the natural sense, I, I just want to just speak quickly. When we all die here on this planet, right, we know that our bodies decompose. And if we're not even very properly, uh, not to be too gross about it, maggots, worms eat away at our flesh. We see it in roadkill or anything of those kind of deals. But we want to look at what the word of God has to say about life forever and death being cast in the lake of fire as we deal with this idea of the immortality of the soul. So in Isaiah 66, the word of God says in verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath in order that all flesh shall worship before me. So Isaiah speaks in the sense that we are going to have life after death in being able to uh, be able to be in the company of God uh, uh, in eternity. But let's talk about the second death. Isaiah goes on to say in verse 24, and they shall look forth and look upon the courses of men who have transgressed against me. These are the unrighteous. And here is this expression, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be in an horrors of the flesh. If you couple that and talk about death and Hades, um, this concept, go to Revelation chapter 20 and beginning with verse 14. The word of God says, death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the in the written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So what we have here from the word of God is that death is going to have an end. There's a lake of fire, but it does not burn forever. Now let's go back and see if we can look at what Jesus said here about this expression, the worm does not die. And we'll look at uh, this passage in Mark 9. Perhaps we've heard it when Jesus makes this hyperbole statement, uh, beginning with verse 42. But whosoever causes one of these little ones 
who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a millstone were hung around his neck and thrown into the sea. Verse 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better that you enter into life main rather than having two hands to go to hell into fire that shall not be quenched. And here's the expression, where the worm does not die and the fire does not quench. He says the same thing as it relates to your foot. <laughs> if your yes. foot causes you the same, cut it off. It's better to you to enter into life lame where, again, the worm does not die, and, uh, uh, rather than going into hellfire where the worm does not die and the fire does not quench. And then lastly, he speaks about uh, your eye. If your eye causes you to sin. Now, obviously, this is not to be taken literally. Because, just to be clear about it, if you got a bad hand that's sinning and you cut off that right hand, that's not going to stop your left hand from doing the same thing, right? We're talking about a character that is not converted. The point that God is making is that there are eternal consequences for how you live. If you live righteously with a relationship with God, you have eternal life. And if you do not choose that and you choose to live differently, you have an eternal death where you are separated from God. There is no concept in the word of God of an eternal burning hell with an eternity of torture. There is no such place as even purgatory that we'll talk about in a minute. There is no universal restoration of all sinners. These are concepts that are not found in the word of God. In the end, we are either going to be totally slave, saved or totally lost. There's no middle ground. We can either have eternal life or face eternal destruction, meaning this is when you're dead, dead. Just let me, if I can, use this illustration. We recently discussed Lazarus. Lazarus was dead and then resurrected, resurrected right? Right. And Lazarus was resurrected. Lazarus, if he didn't have some things right in his life, he got a second chance, if you will, right? But then he died, and now that Lazarus is in the grave with whatever is the consequence of his life, either a relationship with God that he held on to, or one that he didn't, and he separated. So the choices that we make today have eternal, if you will, everlasting, if we will, outcomes. And the and so to that end, it makes us, it makes us, it should make us more aware and 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 uh, intentional of how we live, because we will either spend eternity with God or we will spend eternity away from God. This is what this expression is meaning. There's one other thing I'd like to share with you that might be of help. It's a passage of scripture from early writings. It says, I saw that some were quickly destroyed while others suffered longer. They were punished according to the deeds done in the body. Some were many days consuming, and just as long as there was a portion of them unconsumed, all the sense of suffering remain, said the angel. The worm of life shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched as long as there is a, at least a particle for it to prey on. So here again is the full consequence of our choices in life. But it begs another question, and perhaps I'll pose it to you, Sister Jackson. Where are immortal souls supposed to go? <laughs> you know? Okay. Where are mortal souls supposed to go? Yes, ma'am. When they die? Yeah. To the grave. <laughs> asleep. Um, I have Monday's lesson, which is called The Fires of hell. And Brother Rodriguez has uh, given you some of the texts that I was going to, to talk about. You know, there are many people who believe in the idea 
that the wicked will be tortured in hell forever and ever. And it's, they believe that based on some of these texts that Brother Rodriguez gave us, Matthew 18, which talks about cutting off your foot um, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into the life, enter into life main, rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Mm. And then Matthew 25 talks about the same thing. Uh, cut off your left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And um, then in Matthew 25, verse 46, it says, and these shall go away, talking about the wicked, into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, even though people interpret texts like this to mean that the wicked will continue to suffer on and on mm. in the fires of hell, if we carefully compare the text that I have just read with similar texts on the same subject, on the subject of hell, we can come away with, with, with a different uh, conclusion. Brother Rodriguez, would you put up? Um, yes, that's it. Now, um, when you talk about everlasting or eternal, are uh, forever kinds of things. In the scripture, there are several meanings for these words. One meaning is that there's a beginning and an end. And I'm going to come back and talk about that and give you some examples of that. Um, another meaning is there is a beginning, but no end, such as eternal life of the redeemed. John 3.16 talks about that, as well as John 3.36 talks about it. And then eternity or forever or everlasting might refer to no, where there is no beginning or no end. And that is talking about God, the only true God himself. Right. And you have a couple of texts here, Genesis 21, 33, where Abraham is calling on God and he calls him the everlasting God. Um, and in 1 Timothy, um, Paul is talking about God having immortality and eternal dominion. That means God will never die because God has immortality. Now let's go back to the first meaning, eternity or forever or everlasting with a beginning and an end. And the first example I want to give you is example uh, in Jonah, Jonah 2, verse 6. And Jonah says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountain, the earth with her balls, and about for the earth with her balls was about me forever. Uh, now, we know from scripture that Jonah did not stay in the belly of the whale forever, right? Right. He was only there for three days and three nights. 
and then he was out. In 1 Samuel, we read that Hannah said, she said to her husband, I will go up unto, go up until the child be weaned. I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Hmm. Now we know that Hannah meant abide until he dies. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was an end to that. Um, we can go to, uh, I've, I've got several texts here. We can go to Genesis 44, uh, where um, Joseph's brothers are in Egypt. And they're having to go back home. And Joseph was saying, leave Benjamin. So one of the brothers was pleading that to not leave Benjamin. And because his father would, it would kill his father if Benjamin didn't come back. But the, the brother said in Genesis 42, verse 32, your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, forever, mm -hmm. which means all of his life. Yes. Now, there is, there is one other text that I want to read. I think it's in Jude 1 verse 7, where we're talking about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities, and the text read, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now we know that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was completely burned up. Mm -hmm. If it was eternal, really, um, a fire going on and on and on, we would know that, that they would still be burning. But if you if you visit that area today, there will be no Sodom and Gomorrah there. There are biblical examples like the ones that we just went through uh, that does not depict a never ending experience. The term may depict a certain period of time uh, it may depict until the end of life, or it may be talking about burning completely, burning up completely. Now, concerning the destruction of the wicked, I want to look at Malachi 4, 1 to 3. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wicked shall be stubble. Yes. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, um, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Um, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, said the Lord of hosts. Now, there's also Ezekiel 28, and I'm just giving you little, little snatches. There are several other scriptures that will support this. Uh, where in Ezekiel, 
This scripture is referring to the devil. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Now, all these texts, these texts are talking about forever, meaning uh, complete, uh, meaning destruction, but not meaning burning mm -hmm. forever and ever. Mm -hmm. um, there's one other text I want to read, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and homemongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, I'm taking from Revelation 21, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, and brother, uh, which is the second death, which brother, um, brother Rodriguez talked about. Uh, and also in Revelation 20, it talks about the devil being cast in the lake of fire. Um, and also in Psalms 37, the evildoers shall be cut off for those that wait upon the Lord, that thou, that sh but those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Now, the Bible is clear that the fires of hell will burn up the wicked, leaving them neither root nor branch. Um, a time is coming that, that that is going to happen. Um, and if you need more proof, mm. <laughs> when you look at the lake of fire, um, you see that this earth is going to be consumed, engulfed with fire. God will cleanse the earth from sin and sinners with, with this lake of fire that uh, is talked about in Revelation. And then we got the good news the Lord would then create a new yeah. heaven and a new earth yes. where the righteous will live right. forever Amen. with him. Amen. It's important for us to note that um, and to stand on this precious promise that God has for his children, the new heaven and the new earth. And not only that, but he describes what's going to happen in the new heaven and the new earth. That shall we he shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. There will be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. And when we look at that. If hell's fire continued forever and ever and ever, that would not be the case. Yeah. There would be pain and crying um, and, and sorrow. But I think Brother Rodriguez also read a text that, that said death and hell was going to be put in that lake of fire. Yes. It was going to do away with that mm -hmm. and cleanse this mm -hmm. earth of sin. That is a loving God, people. Amen. The God we serve is a loving God. And he doesn't leave the wicked to just suffer and suffer and suffer. Mm. Um. So as we look at this, we see 
that we want to be on the side of the righteous, the eternal, so that we can live eternally. Amen. 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 So on Tuesday's lesson, we're going to talk about purgatory. What is purgatory? Where is purgatory? <laughs> and how can and we where is it in the Bible? access purgatory? Yeah. To take... Yes, and where is it in the Bible? So purgatory is a non-biblical doctrine. You either be on the side of God or you face the judgment of God for your sins. So he says purgatory is described as a place between heaven and hell. Where is that? Their souls are purifying their sins before the entering heaven. Their living relatives or friends are supposed to intercede for them with penance and masses. So where did this idea of purgatory come from? And I'm going to read from the Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church as written in the New York Double Day uh, nine, and published in 1995, page 291. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after de death, they undergo purification so as to achieve holiness or the holiness that is necessary to enter heaven. The Bible teaches, however, that the dead knows nothing and that no one can intercede, can intercede no sin can be transferred from our righteousness from one person to the other. And that judgment and is an individual thing. So where did the idea of penance came from? It says several churches, like the Catholic, the Coptic, and the Orthodox defend similar doctrines. However, this goes against the Bible because the Bible only have the cut and dry. Either you're on the right or the left, you're righteous or you're unrighteous. So Ecclesiastics 9 verse 10 says what? The dead are not conscious souls. So you can't intercede. No one can intercede on the part of the dead. He says no one can sanctify or transfer their holiness to other people, as the, over there in Ezekiel 18, verse 20, and Psalm 49, 8. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, it says, there is only one mediator between God and men, and that is Christ Jesus. And then the other text says in Hebrews 9, 27, and in Acts 17, verse 31, he says, after death, there is only the judgment. There is no intermediate state. So the idea of and the concept of purgatory is not biblical. So what does the Bible talk about? It said there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. That is Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. And it Solomon said this in the context of whatever your hand 
find to do. Do it with your might, for mm. there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave. Everybody knows that, that mm. when you die and you're put in the grave, there's nothing else you can do. Dictators knows that. Huh? Mm. That's why they have their enemies killed and put in the grave. They know that. But then he's he says the righteous of one fallen human being, the righteousness of one fallen human being cannot be transferred to another fallen human being. How could it? And he says, what the soul who sins shall what? Shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Hmm? So we are setting out tonight to prove that the concept of purgatory is not a biblical one. Because it says, but if a wicked man turns from his sins, which he has committed, this is God talking, keeping all my statutes and those what is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. None of the transgression which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked soul shall die? God says, and not that they should turn away from their ways and live. Amen. So God is not, has no pleasure in having people die in their sins or wickedness. First Timothy 1 verse 22 verse 25 says what? For there is one God, one mediator between God and men. Christ. And that's the man Christ Jesus. And I think we need to emphasize that or even pause there for a minute to look at this. This is the biblical terminology. This is the biblical doctrine when it comes to mediation. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And that who we mediator is Christ Jesus. So we can't buy, we can't purchase forgiveness for our relatives, mm -hmm. our friends, our associate. Because it says, Christ, it was appointed for men to die once. And after that, the judgment. So death is followed by a judgment. Whether it's now or later, whether it's this year or a thousand years, or this year or a hundred years, death is followed by judgment. And so the tonight we are, or today, this morning, we are faced with the issue of what purgatory means. And it says, purgatory is a doctrine that is non-biblical. Mm. There's nowhere in the Bible that you're going to find this word purgatory. There's nowhere in the Bible you're going to find the concept of purgatory. We just talk about the concept of mediation. And it's only one person can perform that mediation. And it is Christ himself, the man Christ Jesus himself. Amen. So, is how you live and the way you die that is going to determine whether you go to heaven or hell, as was mentioned before. Not that I could 
get some money and buy your soul out of purgatory or buy your soul out of hell or buy your soul out of eternal destruction. No. This is a personal thing between each individual and their savior and their Lord, whether they live righteously or they live in sin. So we're going to see uh, Wednesday, a paradise with disembodied souls. Let, let me, I, 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 I would like some Wednesday. sympathy from my colleagues here on purgatory. So if you can help me get some sympathy mm. for the notion of purgatory. <laughs> so let me try. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the construct that we have. The construct that we have is that we believe that the soul is immortal, and if you're good, you're going to heaven as soon as you die. And that's the place to be. That's what I'm selling. Mm. But let's assume that you are bad. You are now going to hellfire that is gonna punish you and burn you forever. And there are, uh, uh, and those, there are no worms that mm. will be eating you up, mm -hmm. right? It's just fire, Right. it's just fire. Mm. And you will have fire forever. Now, let's assume I'm a young person growing up in church and I'm doing some bad things and, and, and you hear me. I, I, I need something to keep me um, up going. Mm. So, so here is what the catechism says. It says, all who die in God's grace, I'm reading from Tuesday's, from Wednesday's lesson in our Bible study guide. It says, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectively pure you know you're, you're going for the purification you're not just dying you are sort of imperfect you are not just bad going up in that fire so you you, you are half good but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven mm. and that Quotes from the Catechism of 1995, page 291. Do you see why they are, are trying to suggest that you know you, you're just not going to be burned up? You, 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 you're going to go to a place. Not only that, um, your, your suffering can be alleviated by the prayers of your loved ones, as well as by other acts on behalf of the dead, that almsgiving, brother dogs, indulgences, works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Mm. It takes me back to uh, some of the old readings we used to have in church called um, the Bible Speaks. Mr. Jackson did a wonderful job on a lot of the things that the Bible speaks that in Ecclesiastes 9 and 10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do. You remember that? Yes. Do it with yes. all your might. Yes. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 18 and 12, I think Sister Jackson pointed that out, the soul uh, and the laws, you mentioned that, the soul. So it's, it's what the Bible says. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father the guilt of the son, because we have one mediator. Is that correct, Brother Dawes? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes sir. One mediator. Jesus. Christ Jesus Christ. Yes. Hebrews 9 and 27 says, and is appointed for men 
what should happen? Wants to die once. Wants to die, but after this, the judgment. The judgment. The, the, Bible, the, judgment. Speaks. the Bible speaks. We have an application question for you. What do such errors as purgatory or eternal torment teach us about the importance of doctrine? <clears throat> Why <clears throat> is what we believe of importance not just in whom we believe? <clears throat> Thursday. <laughs> if I might just chime in here a little bit. It's important not only who you believe, but what you believe. Because you can believe in God, but you may believe that he is not a kind God. You may believe yes. that he's a vindictive God. So it's important to us also understand <clears throat> what you believe. Because the word of God does not talk about purgatory, right? It's a whole different concept of God if that's a real thing. Or an internal burning hellfire. <clears throat> That's a whole different kind of God than the one that is in the Word of God. So it, it's it's important to have clarity on both of those propositions. Let, let me ask it this way. You know, um, Satan said, you shall not surely die. Right. And God says that you shall surely die. Does it have any application here? Yes. Absolutely. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think all of these interpretations... Um, are carried uh, on carried on that lie that Satan said in Genesis. Um, you know, after death, if you go to purgatory, you shall not surely die. Um, if you burn in forever, you're not dead. Right. <laughs> um, if your soul after death, if your soul is someplace else. If it's in heaven or looking around or, or running around on earth or coming back as a as another form of life, you shall you're not dead. So Satan is keeping this going. Amen. So it's important it's keeping the lie that we going. read the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Brother Rodriguez, we, we have some folks on Thursday's lesson who actually went to heaven. All right. So, uh, yeah. So this is from Wednesdays as well. So let, well, let's just uh, kind of look at this so that we can have a, a real understanding about, you know, the idea of a paradise with disembodied souls uh, or the idea that there's no direct translations to heaven unto, unto death. All right. So when we go and look at the word of God here in um, Revelations chapter 13 and verse 6, we have this, uh, this passage that says, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwelled in heaven. All right. So that begs the question, who is in heaven, <laughs> all right? And uh, the word of God, uh, once again, is very clear to us so that we don't have to try to figure this out. We're going to look at passages of scriptures that will tell us who is in heaven right now, all right? So when we go to, uh, when we go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 5, and beginning with verse 24, it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So this is the first person that was ever translated. Enoch did not die. He took him and was translated to heaven. Then, so we know Enoch is in heaven based on Genesis chapter 5. Now we go again to the word of God. And if we go to 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 9, we read, And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elijah said, 
excuse me, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happens as they continued and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horse of horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So that's the second person in heaven from the word of God. Enoch went, Elijah went. They were translated. They did not see death. And we, you may recall a few a weeks ago, we read Jude, verse 9, where it talks about, yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a, rail, a railing uh, accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So here, Moses was resurrected because we know Moses died on Mount Nebo. And Micah resurrected Moses, and we know that Moses came down from heaven along with Elijah to encourage Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, or on the Mount of Transfiguration, I should say, uh, when God needed encouragement. And so we know those three individuals are in heaven. But then we read in Matthew 27, verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rock was split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So we have these individuals that were raised at the... Um, at uh, the resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And so yes. we have these individuals who are already in heaven, but we have no record of any other persons. Lazarus, who died and was resurrected, is not in heaven. Right. We have other individuals who were resurrected. The widow of Nain's son, who was out on the way to uh, a burial, was resurrected, but he's not in heaven. So we have a, 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 a clarity from the word of God that for man, most of man's uh, experience is to die awaiting the resurrection. That is the promise that we have. But let's go a little further and look at this uh, nice uh, counsel that's given to us again. I'll read from the Spirit of Prophecy. Men entertain errors when the truth is clearly marked out. And if they would but bring their doctrines to the word of God and not read the word of God in the light of their own doctrines to prove their ideas right, they would not walk in darkness and blindness and cherish error. Many give the words of scripture a meaning that suits their own opinions, and they mislead themselves and deceive others by their misinterpretation of the word. Amen. So it begs the question, who can be immortal. Well, there's good news tonight. <laughs> because in Matthew 25, 6 says, and those who go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. God has promised for us immortality, yeah. my friends. And we will get there either through the resurrection process, if we die before he comes, or we might be translated in that time when he returns. It's a wonderful uh, promise that is given to us. And so um, we can take courage in knowing that what God has said to us is a true statement, something that we can have confidence in. Um, the question here on the slide says, does eternal life have an end to? Uh, and it says, God is the only true immortal being. He's the only one who can give and sustain life. Therefore, our created beings have a conditional immortality. That is, uh, we what must we do to get eternal life and never die? The question is, he who has a son has what? Life. Life. And since we life. 
will be close to Jesus forever, we will experience life. That is a wonderful, wonderful promise that is made to us <coughs> and one that I hope all of us can claim for us. Here is the takeaway for today. Jesus is coming, but not to reign as a temporal prince. He will rise, raise the righteous dead, change the living saints to a glorious immortality, and with the saints, take the kingdom under the whole heaven. This kingdom will never end. Then those who have patiently waited for Jesus will be made like him. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father in yes. God, we are so thankful that you have blessed us to have this study this morning on hellfire. For God, it has been a source of confusion, mm -hmm. of fear. Many do not want to have <clears throat> any part of you, O oh God, as they see you as this vindictive uh, uh, being who is just anxious to burn people in hellfire. But we see, O oh God, that you have made it possible for that not to be a part of our experience. And so tonight, I pray, O oh God, that those who have tuned in would find comfort in knowing that Jesus loves and Jesus saves. I pray, O oh God, that you would allow Amen. us to dwell on this fact that you came and died on the cross so that we might be saved, not that we would be lost. Thank you for all your mercies. Thank you for your saving grace. And I pray, O oh God, in that day when you come back, may we be able to have a place with you and your kingdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's time that I can share with you our mission spotlight story, and I invite you to be a part of our study on next week. Thank you for joining us.
Thanks for joining us in our interactive Sabbath School class today, and we appreciate your participation in virtual Sabbath School. Join us next week as we continue our discussion. Stay tuned for our next service.